Welcome to the GCN Tech Clinic, where we answer your tech-related questions that you've been leaving under our videos and content using the hashtag AskGCNTech. And our first question this week is from Colin Hood, who says, why do pros, brackets not all, not post their ride data? When will we see live data during races like what we see in Formula One or MotoGP? This is a great question. And the first thing to point out is that we have started to see this um, in some races during some coverage. We do see sort of things like cadence and heart rate and wattage and speed and things like that that certain riders have been doing in races, which is great to see, but not all riders. And also when you look at things like Strava, where riders upload their rides, some strip out uh, a lot of the data as well uh, so that people can't see it. And the reason they do this is they just don't want their rivals or rival teams and coaches to know what they can do as it could potentially expose a weakness in their physiology that could be exploited tactically within a race. So some of them are quite protective over it. A lot of others, and particularly younger riders, are very open about sharing their power data and what they can do, which I think is great to see. It adds transparency into the sport. It shows that you know what these people are doing is, is human and, and probably clean um, and well within the realms of sort of human physiology, but still impressive nonetheless. And it, it's also one of the reasons why we've launched Race Pass as well, because we believe that this is a way in which we can improve cycling coverage and give greater sort of insight and detail and interactivity as well, you know, within the app. So hopefully in the future, as coverage improves, this is something we will see more of and it will get to a point where you, you know, it is a bit more like Formula One or MotoGP where you can see all those sort of stats on screen because uh, it is something that people want um, on both sides of, of, of the screen. Next question is from Justin P who says, Hi, I just got a new Shimano Claris group set except for the brakes. My question is, could I use Shimano Claris with other Shimano brakes, but using the Shimano Claris levers? For example, Shimano Sora or Tiagra. Thanks. Yep, Justin, um, there's a lot of cross compatibility with group sets, particularly in the same brand. So for example, yeah, you can use um, different tiers of Shimano, say Sora, Tiagra or Claris, different sort of cassettes and chain sets and chains and things like that, as long as they are the same speed uh, cassette. Obviously, if one's 10 and one's 11, that's, that's not gonna work. But um, yeah, there's a lot of cross compatibility and with brakes too, uh, that should be fine. One thing to be aware of is if you were to use, say, SRAM brakes, that wouldn't, well, probably wouldn't work because SRAM brake levers have a slightly different amount of cable that they pull in the lever action, which then translates differently into the caliper as well. So SRAM levers are designed to work with SRAM brakes, Shimano levers designed to work with Shimano brakes, but you should be fine using Sora or Tiagra. Next question is from Thomas Gorlinski or Gav Gavlinski, I think that will be, uh, who says, I use an eight-speed cassette on a 10-speed hub, and he's planning to upgrade to an 11-speed hub in the future. Because he has a 10-speed hub, should he have any problems if he tries to change the free hub body on his wheel to an 11-speed one? Hi, Thomas, this is a great question, and, and something that I think a lot of people uh, will want to know the answer to, uh, as it's quite a common upgrade that people make. Um, and it's difficult to answer it 100% without knowing the exact bike and wheel uh, and hub that you currently have. But generally speaking, the simple answer is yes, you should have no problems switching out the free hub body to an 11, an 11 speed one. It's normally quite a simple job and usually only requires basic tools, probably only um, an Allen key or something similar like that. But sometimes you don't even need any tools at all. If it's a DT Swiss one, it'll just pop off. But um, yeah, you should be fine. I have a question now from Elors007, who says, if I have no interest in going faster, but I'd just rather get less tired and be able to travel further, what is more beneficial, aerodynamics or weight? Right, now, unless you're traveling, no, the, right, okay, the only time when weight is gonna be more beneficial than aerodynamics is in an uphill time trial. 
is if you're just traveling uphill and then your bike ride starts at the bottom of hill, finishes at the top of hill. In every other situation where you're then also going downhill, riding on the flat, riding into headwinds, riding on rolling terrain, riding with a tailwind, aerodynamics becomes the dominant thing that you have to overcome, the dominant force. That considered, aerodynamics is the way to go if you want to ride further for the same effort um, and be less tired. Science and maths tells us this and some people will go, oh well I don't ride very fast, I'm not riding at Tour de France speed so aerodynamics doesn't matter to me. That's not true, that's a myth. Even if you're riding at say just sort of 20 kilometers an hour, which is achievable for many cyclists on the flat, aerodynamics is still the dominant force you need to overcome. And what, what, what's found as a rule of thumb is that the slower rider will spend more time on the course when it's modeled and they're, although the wattage savings that they're sort of in theory getting are lower at a lower speed than what say a 50 kilometer an hour Tour de France rider is getting, because they're on the course longer, the overall time saving actually sort of tends to equal out uh, as being roughly the same. So yeah, biggest saving to be made, aerodynamics. Next question is from Joran van Dale, who says, any ideas on wheel storage for an extra wheel set? It needs to be in line with the garage wall to save space. The most simple way to do it is to just simply get some hooks and ideally ones with like a rubber coating on them so it doesn't scratch anything, um, and then screw them into the wall and then hang the wheels off hooks. Or it could just be um, like a, a sort of straight uh, pole that comes out of the wall at a slight angle so it holds the wheel onto it um, and just hang the wheel off something like that. That would work. And yeah, that would be the most simple, simple solution uh, to do and probably what I would do in your situation. You I mean, you could go fancy and build some like shelves or something with grooves in them, but yeah, hooks is the most, most simple way to do it. Um, another good thing to do would be to look at uh, one of our videos of, of inside mechanics team trucks because they obviously have loads of elegant ways of storing loads of wheels loads of frames and loads of bike kit in a small space so check that out they actually have custom racking made that they can then hang all the wheels on and actually secure them uh, either via the through axle or via the quick release skewer so you could do some wacky thing where you secure some kind of um, quick release skewer into the wall um, and then you can slot the wheel on and hold it via um, the, the axle, which would be, that'd be pretty neat. Next question is from Tom McCafferty, who says, Ollie, when are you gonna return all the tools that you borrowed during lockdown? Seems that there's a lot of open slots behind you. Don't know what you're talking about, mate. Moving swiftly on. Uh, Weck F1 uh, says, hi, I was in a crash. I'm okay, it's good to know. And my Shimano Claris STI left lever has moved over. I'm wondering how to adjust it to the correct position. Also, should I replace my helmet even if I didn't land on my head? Luckily, I was only about a mile from home. Uh, would a higher quality tire have more grip on a wet surface? Wow, a lot of questions. Right, first up, lever. Really easy to move your lever into the correct position. You will find that there is a circlip uh, clamping clip in here that clamps the lever to the bars. You can get in there with an Allen key by pulling the lever hood out the way. That gives you access on my one, it's there. And that will allow you to un loosen that, move the lever straight, tighten it back up again. You're good to go. Um, with regards to your helmet, if you didn't land on your helmet, that should be fine. And with regards to tires having different grip in the wet, yes, certain rubber compound tires have really hard rubber compound and they're less grippy on wet surfaces. But something else that makes a big difference is tire pressure. So you'll see a lot of racers actually lower their pressure quite low in the wet, particularly in criteriums and things like the Tour Series that we have here in the UK. And they'll run surprisingly low tire pressures uh, because that deformation of the tire does give uh, more grip. But uh, yeah, hopefully that helps you there. And last up, we've got a question from Matt H6565, who says, Hi Ollie, I've been looking into doing my own bike maintenance a bit more recently. Good for you. Uh, but he says he doesn't have a bike stand yet. Is it a bad idea to flip the bike upside down so that it's resting on the saddle and handlebars when working on the drivetrain, for example? It's what I was shown when I was younger, but I've never seen you guys do it. Right. The textbook way to work on a bike, 
I mean, that, that you would teach someone is to put it in a stand. That is better, it's easier to work on and it keeps the bike safe and sound. But if I didn't have a stand, yeah, I would turn the bike upside down and work on it that way. Just don't tell anyone that I told you to do that. It's absolutely fine. One thing you should do though is put it on a, make sure that the, where you're putting the bike isn't gonna damage it. So, you know, put like a, a rug down or something. And also nothing's gonna drip off the bike, like any oil or stuff onto your, your mum's carpet. I've definitely never done that, mum. Yeah, definitely never done that. And yeah, you should be fine. It's, it's definitely a sort of, a sort of hack slash bodge way you can work on a bike if you don't have a stand. Something you can do though, is if you have a turbo trainer, you can use that as a makeshift stand. So you can clamp your bike into a turbo trainer and work on it that way. That's another quite easy way to do and it's a bit better than having your bike upside down where it can perilously fall over. Um, but as long as you're careful, then you should be okay. Right, that's all we've got time for uh, in the tech clinic this week, but thanks for your questions. It's always a pleasure answering them and keep them coming in using the hashtag AskGCNTech. And if you like what we do, then well, please give us a thumbs up and uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I'll see you uh, in the next video.